Hello, everyone. I'm honored and shocked to be this year's recipient of this award. So shocked that I spent the past several days rereading the note from Dr. Marta Wing, thinking she was notifying me that someone I had nominated won the award. The price that I've had to pay is that I've had to learn how to produce a narrated PowerPoint on a very short time scale. Over the past decades, I've learned an enormous amount from all of you, and I'm very grateful for all your contributions to the fields of molecular and genome evolution. I hope you'll find something of interest here from me. I'd like to start by acknowledging my predecessors in this award, as all of their work has greatly inspired my own research. It all starts with Tomoka Oda, who taught us about the concept of effective neutrality and how this influences patterns of molecular variation within and among species. Ford Doolittle, highly unusual biochemist, taught us about junk DNA and the idea that intronic and mobile element associated DNA may accumulate in effectively neutral fashion in different phylogenetic lineages. Nancy Moran did foundational work on the accumulation of deleterious mutations in serial bottleneck endosymbionts when Sung Lee and Brian Charlesworth have made numerous contributions to theoretical population genetics, much of what is associated with the concept of effective neutrality. I thought I would start with a historical narrative of my career development, as where I am today is quite distant from where I started. As a graduate student at the University of Minnesota, I was interested in limnology and ecology. To the upper left is a picture of me and two of my lab mates. I'll let you decide which one's me. We were very interested in plankton community structure in lakes and the way in which this might be manipulated to control water quality. We did some of the first experiments, whole ecosystem manipulation, coined the term biomanipulation, which is now a widely used strategy for controlling water quality in lakes based on ecological principles. To the lower right is what happens when you dump an entire tractor trailer of dry ice into a lake. We were interested in the effects of CO2 on phytoplankton community structure. We shut down an entire highway and got in quite a deal of trouble with the state police on that one. To the upper right is a picture of my PhD advisor, Dr. Joe Shapiro, and he's giving a hug to Dr. Bob Sterner, who was the first undergraduate in my lab, went on to become the head of the department in which I got my PhD. I moved immediately from graduate school to the University of Illinois, where I was hired as an assistant professor in aquatic ecology, but I quickly underwent a phase transition. It had recently been discovered that it was possible to isolate proteins from individuals on a gel electrophoretic apparatus, separate the molecules by charge, and get the first glimpse of natural variation in populations. All the methodology worked immediately for our favorite model organism, Daphnia pulex, and for, from there its history. I also was becoming increasingly enamored by the mathematical rigor of theoretical population genetics. There's a lot of excitement going on at the University of Illinois in the field of evolution at the time in many areas. Carl Woese was right down the hall from me learning how to sequence ribosomal RNA, applying it to deep phylogenetic problems. You all know about the third form of life that, was, uh, that came out of this work. Down the road. And the animal science department was the best statistical genetics group in the world at the time. We spent an enormous number of hours together poring over all the foundational papers in the field from Pearson to Fisher and so on. This was my first entree into the field of quantitative genetics. And then a fateful phone call came from Bruce Walsh, uh, and this led to a lifelong project in the field of quantitative genetics for us. We published two books. Now, 1998, the first book came out, so-called Volume 2 just came out a couple of years ago. We call this second volume Volume 2 because it's twice the biomass of Volume 1. Any of you guys out there with reproductive fitness left in, you should be careful about allowing this to sit on your laps for too long. My first foray into theory development in the field of quantitative genetics resulted in this paper here done with Bill Hill. You all know about the Hill-Robertson effect. This work was done prior to email days. We were in about a four week cycle. I would spend about two weeks deriving 20 pages or so of equations, sending them to Bill. He would immediately respond uh, with this scrawl that I could barely read, but generally the take home message was, dear Mike, 
You just spent 20 pages on something that would be done in three lines on the back of an envelope. And besides, you made a mistake back on page two. And we would go back and forth recycling these, these questions and ideas for a long period of time, resulting eventually in what I think turned out to be a fairly nice paper. Shortly thereafter, I started getting large envelopes full of reprints from this man here, who I understand was quite enamored by the idea of neutral theory. As a consequence, I'm now the proud owner of autographs from both of these major luminaries in our field. The University of Illinois was a great place to start my career, but in 1989, the University of Oregon attracted me with big trees, hot springs, and an entire ocean. And I went there to start a new program in ecology and evolution. One of the things we continued to do while I was there was further develop this concept of mutational meltdown, which essentially takes Muller's ratchet to its final manifestation, extinction of population. So we were able to estimate the mean time to extinction under various circumstances. This also got me into the field of conservation genetics. The work was done in collaboration with Wilfried Gabriel and Reinhard Berger. While at Oregon, I had the great fortune of serving as co-advisor for this man here, Dr. Alan Force. It had long been agreed that the source of new genes in most species is simply the duplication of old genes, but it had also been thought that the only mechanism for the long-term preservation of a duplicate gene was the origin of a new beneficial function with the old copy retaining the original function. Emerging data from polyploid species suggested that many duplicate genes were surviving far too long to be explained by each one of them evolving a new function. Realizing that the regulatory regions of most genes are quite complex with independently mutable subfunctions, Alan and I uh, developed the concept of subfunctionalization, leading to what was uh, what became called the duplication degeneration complementation model. The idea is quite simple. We start with a single copy gene, the gene duplicates, and then a mutational event occurs. In this particular case, uh, the first copy has lost its ability to be expressed in head and essential function, so that preserves the second copy forevermore. And then the next mutation determines the ultimate fate of both copies. Uh, one thing that can happen commonly happens is non-functionalization. So we simply lose the ability of the top copy to be expressed forever. Nothing's really lost because we retain all the original functions in one of the copies. An alternative is neo-functionalization. The second copy loses the ability to be expressed in thorax, but it's expressed in some new tissue in a beneficial way to the organism. But we think that well, the most common fate of duplicate genes is illustrated here. The second mutation changes the regulatory region, the second copy in a way that it's no longer expressed in thorax. The two copies now are now sub, subdividing the original functions of the one copy of the gene. We call this subfunctionalization. Over the past few years, there have been some 15,000 publications invoking subfunctionalization as a mechanism driving various cellular forces. Uh, speaking of forces, Alan, unfortunately, is no longer with us in the field of genetics. He moved on to become the guitar player with the bending spoon. A lot started happening with respect to our understanding of genome evolution in the late uh, 1990s. We happened to be in the right place at the right time. John Pulsaway, the other co-advisor, Alan Forrest, discovered that zebrafish is a victim of an ancient genome duplication. We were able to move on quickly and find the first example of subfunctionalization with this engrail gene. One copy is expressed in the pectoral fin appendages, the other is expressed in the segmental interneurons. If you look at the single copy ortholog of this gene in mouse, you'll find that it's expressed in both kinds of tissues. So this was a clear example of a partitioning up of old functions rather than the origin of a new function in the duplicate gene. As whole genome sequences became available, John Connery and I realized that you could interrogate single genomes for the presence of all possible duplicate gene pairs. This is a dot plot for C. elegans. There's about a thousand duplicate gene pairs we found. Uh, by using silent site divergence, you can figure out the age distribution of these duplicate genes and genomes. And here's a couple of examples. Uh, from the slope and the intercept, you can figure out the birth rate and the death rate of such genes. And we were able to conclude that the average rate of gene duplication is roughly equal to the average mutation rate per nucleotide site uh, per genome. So this gave us a 
first glimpse of the dynamics of the origin of duplicate genes as more and more genomes became available, it was possible to think about the scaling relations of genome content and genome size. We quickly learned that the reason that most uh, land, plant, and animal genomes are particularly expanded is not because of the increase in the coding DNA, but because of the proliferation of all kinds of classes of non-coding DNA, introns, pseudogenes, and all classes of transposable elements, something that wouldn't have surprised Ford Doolittle. Now, from these studies on comparative genome architecture, my interest started to become focused on gene structural differences between phylogenetic lineages, leading to the idea that much of this variation is driven by non-adaptive mechanisms, the so-called mutational hazard hypothesis. It's the basic idea is shown here in cartoon fashion. Prokaryotic genes are the Priuses of the biological world, short, continuous coding regions, no intronic DNA to speak of, very small regulatory regions upstream of some of the genes. On the other hand, to get into eukaryotes, particularly metazoans and land plant genomes, genes are subdivided by large numbers of long introns. Transcripts are, have long UTRs on the front and the high ends, complex regulatory regions, excess energy DNA, and so on. The basic idea here is that all embellishments to gene structure impose weak mutational disadvantages by increasing the ways in which mutation can break a gene. This operates like a weak form of selection. The consequence of this is that such embellishments can only be removed from populations with large effective sizes, but can accumulate in an effectively neutral fashion in things like eukaryotes with smaller NE experiencing relatively high levels of random genetic drift. I summarized my ideas on this as well as the genome architectural differences in this book published a few years later. In 2001, I moved to Indiana University where I be began to explore the topic of population genomics. I won't have time to tell you about this today, but I will give you a brief overview of our mutation rate research, which moved into a much higher level of sophistication than had been previously possible, mainly because it be had become possible to sequence large numbers of genomes. We start with a single individual, we divide it into replicated lines, we take these lines through serial bottlenecks for up to thousands of generations at the end of the experiment. Uh, we sequence the complete genomes of everybody. This tells us not just the mutation rate, but the complete molecular spectrum of mutations within these species. We've done this work now with about 50 different species across the tree of life. In this somewhat dated slide, I've summarized the basic take-home measures, and that is that the mutation rate per nucleotide site scales negatively with the effective population size of the species. You'll note that for a given magnitude of random genetic drift, Unicellular eukaryotes have lower mutation rates than bacteria do. This is quite consistent with theory, which tells us that natural selection should be operating on the mutation rate from the standpoint of the total amount of functional DNA in a genome, not on the basis of single nucleotide sites. These results tie in nicely to an idea that I've been working on for uh, quite a few years, the so-called drift barrier hypothesis. The idea here is quite simple. If we think about a trait, that's under persistent directional selection. And think about different effective population sizes. As we move to the right, the efficiency of selection increases. We expect the mean phenotype then to be pushed closer to the level of molecular perfection defined by the biophysical limit. As a consequence of this, we expect there to be gradients of mean phenotypes with respect to effective population size, exactly the kind of thing we see in the lower left-hand panel. The drift barrier hypothesis is consistent with another set of comparative data that we've been gathering. The error rate, the single nucleotide level in transcription. I won't have time to go through the methods, but you can see to the right that the transcriptional error rate per nucleotide site is 1,000 to 100,000 times higher than the rate in the same organism at the level of replication. These data are consistent with the drift barrier hypothesis because errors arising in transcripts are transient where those at the level of DNA leave lingering effects across generations. Now, having spent considerable amount of time working on evolution at the molecular level and the genomic level, I began to become interested in the possibility of extending the general principles developed there to a higher level of organization. The next logical step seemed to be the cell. The reasons for this are encapsulated in this quote from E.B. Wilson's book. 
The key to every biological problem must be finally sought in the cell, for every living organism is or at some time has been a cell. Quite simple. But yet, here we are. A century later, we have well-established fields of evolutionary ecology and genetics, molecular and genome evolution, developmental evolution, but there's no recognizable evolutionary cell biology. For some reason, we've jumped right over the cell. And the early focus of cell biologists at the beginning of the last century on diversity has been supplanted by a medical orientation of cell biology focused on a few model systems completely devoid of variation. Cell biology provides the links between genotype and phenotype. So this is truly an odd situation. This void is one of the last great frontiers of evolutionary science. And yet most universities are set up to do everything possible to keep cell biologists apart from evolutionary biologists, usually to the extent of being in completely different departments. In 2017, Arizona State University offered me the opportunity to start a new Center for Mechanisms of Evolution. We're focused on understanding evolution at the mechanistic level with a focus on cell biological population genetic issues. We've hired four new faculty members so far. Two more hires are expected this year. We're trying to merge uh, the classical fields of cell biology and evolution in a way that's not normally done in an academic setting. We're bringing in individuals from all areas of the life sciences, as well as biophysics and chemistry. Uh, we're occupying a brand new building. If we're not the gold standard, we can at least be said to be the copper standard. I'd like to spend the remainder of my talk focused on some of the issues that may interest you with respect to cellular evolution. One would think that as one moves up the level of organismal organization, there would be a lower likelihood of random genetic drift governing patterns of variation. But in fact, we see exactly the opposite. Returning to a previous topic, the accumulation of superfluous DNA. Recall that the mutational hazard hypothesis postulates that all excess DNA is dangerous, but weakly so, such that only very low any species are vulnerable to the accumulation of junk DNA. But an excess mutation rate is not the only cost of a cellular embellishment. Building any cellular feature induces a cost at the bioenergetic level in terms of ATP hydrolyses. Like biochemists have taught us a lot about the cost of synthesizing basic building blocks, assembling them into higher order structures, and so on from first principles. So for example, to the left are the average cost of single amino acids, nucleotides, lipids, and so on. Using this information, additional assembly information, one can calculate the cost of any cellular structure. Given the total cost of a cellular feature and dividing it by the total cost of a cell provides us with an estimate of the selective disadvantage of adding an embellishment to a cell under the assumption that it's not paying for itself. We know quite a bit about the cost of building cells. Now for microbial physiology, the cost scales essentially linearly with cell volume across the entire tree of life. Recall that what we are interested in here is the scaling of mean phenotypes with effective population size and or organism size. From our prior work, we know there's a negative association between NE and adult dry weight. What this means is if you live down here with an NE of 10 to the fourth, all deleterious mutations with effects less than 10 to the minus four are free to fix, whereas mutations with advantages less than 10 to the minus four are invisible to promotion by natural selection. If on the other hand, you live up here with the nanny equal 10 to the eight, all mutations of absolute effects greater than 10 to the minus eight are visible to selection. This indicates that there are substantial differences in the granularity of mutational effects subject to selection in different phylogenetic lineages. There are a few organisms for which we have sufficient information and gene activity to compute the total cost of running a gene per cell cycle. Not surprisingly, E. coli is one such organism. On the lower axis, we have the total cost of a full set of genes in terms of ATP hydrolyses per cell cycle. We divide that by the total cost of a cell to get the numbers on the upper axis. This is a measure of the selective disadvantage of a gene or a gene size insert under the assumptions it's not paying for itself. The red line here is a, a position of the drift barrier in E. coli, which has an NE of 10 to the ninth individuals roughly, 
you can see that the distribution of the cost of genes in E. coli is far to the right of the drift barrier. The average gene length is just a thousand bases in E. coli. What this tells us is that inserts of just a few base pairs in this microbial species are visible to the eyes of natural selection, providing us with a mechanistic explanation for genomic streamlining in microbes based on bioenergetic arguments. Moving to the right, we're now, now into eukaryotes of increasing cell size, three things happen. The absolute cost of a gene goes up because of all the embellishments I've talked about before, but the total cost of a cell goes up even faster this results in relative cost of genes being lower than found in bacteria. The drift barrier moves to the right, and as a consequence, the distribution of cost of genes spills across the drift barrier. This tells us that in eukaryotes, in particular multicellular eukaryotes, the relative bioenergetic cost of inserts, even up to dozens of KB, are often too small to be perceived by selection. It's not surprising that on one of the chromosomes of Arabidopsis, there's an insert of an entire mitochondrial genome. Moving on to a higher level of organization, what we have here are plots of the maximum biomass growth rate as a function of mass of maturity over 20 orders of magnitude difference. What you can see here is that for prokaryotes with large NE, there's a positive association between these two traits. But for eukaryotes, whether unicellular or multicellular, there's a negative association. Larger organisms have lower growth rates. The slopes of these relationships are inconsistent with anything that's been suggested by bio, biophysical theory or evolutionary trade-off theory. As we move to the right, as we've seen before, larger organism size is associated with reduction in the effective population size. So these lineages will be more uh, vulnerable to the accumulation of growth altering alleles. So we can think about uh, these data in the following way. The dashed black line is a measure of the maximum achievable growth rate obtainable by natural selection. Under this hypothesis, the empty area in the triangle represents mutation load as a consequence of the accumulation of growth altering alleles. If this hypothesis is correct, the distribution of effects of growth altering alleles has to be negative exponential so that the total load, which would be equal to the product of the selection coefficient and the average number of mutations of such effects remains constant. I'd like to end with an extreme example of cellular diversity in which there's no association of variation with population size, a hallmark of the neutral theory, as illustrated by this quote from Darwin, there's a tendency for biologists to view all aspects of beauty and diversity in nature to be a necessary outcome of natural selection. Of course, the illustration here on the left is a counterexample from the non-biological world. On the right is an illustration of biology snowflakes. In cells, the vast majority of proteins do not operate as monomers, but as multimeric structures. And here I'm talking about a situation in which the independent monomeric structures are all encoded by the same genetic locus. And there's no new function gained by the assembly here with each monomeric subunit retaining its original function. Where does this variation come from, and how is it distributed across the tree of life? If you sum up all of the known structures and the number of subunits in different phylogenetic lineages, you'll find, in general, negative exponential type distributions, and also see that there's no gradient in the level of molecular complexity with organismal complexity. This is quite contrary to the situation with gene structure and genome architecture, here we see that the number of multimeric subunits is essentially the same in big multicellular species as it is in prokaryotes. This lack of association between molecular and organismal complexity is not an artifact of sampling bias in different phylogenetic lineages. If you focus on a set of enzymes with conserved functions across the tree of life, such as those involved in glycolysis, you'll see a large number of alternative forms within phylogenetic lineages, but again, there's no gradient of increasing molecular complexity with organismal complexity. The overall implication of this is that there's tremendous freedom for the multimeric states of proteins to wander over the evolutionary landscape. This all has the flavor of random genetic drift governing the process. We can think about this problem in a more theoretical way by considering this linear model with the state on the left being a monomeric protein and moving to the right dimeric states with increasing strength of binding uh, between the interfaces. U is a measure of the rate of gain of a binding site. V is the rate of loss. We can add in upward or downward selection pressure. 
Over time, a system like this will reach a steady state distribution. In this case, it turns out to be a Poisson distribution with the probabilities defining the probability of populations being in alternative states in a particular population genetic environment. The key parameter is a composite of mutation pressure, U over V, and selection, weighting factor, where Sn is a measure of the ratio of the power of selection to the power of random genetic drift. The plot in the lower right gives us some of these distributions for various population genetic environments. I want to just make three points. First, there's substantial phenotypic variation among lineages, even when selection and mutation operate identically in all lineages. You can see this from the form of these individual distributions. The most common state is not necessarily the optimum state. Here, the optimum is far to the right and no one gets there. Under effective neutrality, NS equals zero, the weighting term to the selection goes away, and the form of the distribution is completely independent of the population size, which is reminiscent of the results that I just gave you. So here's an aspect of extremely widespread biodiversity, the multimeric forms of proteins, with an enormous amount of speculation in the biochemistry literature on its adaptive significance, but in reality with no support whatsoever for lineage-specific differences in forms of selection. Summing up, what occurs in evolution is dictated by what natural selection cannot do. Natural selection's relentless search for perfection is limited by the granularity of mutational effects, patterns of mutational bias, and the power of random genetic drift. At all levels of biological organization, we expect mean phenotypes to scale with NE so that organisms under identical selection pressures will nonetheless experience phenotypic divergence. We've seen from empirical data that the reduction in NE induced by increased organism size leads to an increased mutation rate, passive expansion of genome size and gene architectural complexity, and a reduction in maximum growth rate. So this is really a unifying hypothesis for explaining patterns of diversity in a wide range of biological traits. If this hypothesis is correct, as further comparative data accumulate, we expect to see size-associated gradients and mean phenotypes for a wide variety of biochemical and cellular features. Of course, the research that I've just described couldn't have been accomplished without the efforts of a large number of people. I've listed here the postdocs and the graduates who have been through my lab since its beginning. And there's photographs here given of my lab at 2015 in Indiana and then a few years later, Arizona State University. People in my lab have ranged from the field of ecology to population genetics, quantitative genetics, molecular genetics, and now cell and genome biology. Many of them have gone on to their own illustrious careers. Thanks to each of these individuals who've taught me much more than I've taught them, I'm sure, and thanks to the funding agencies that have enabled us to continually move our research forward for the past 40 years.